surely the rut can't be on with 18 degree tropical heat. It absolutely is. And Roy has a very special buck in his sights. I don't want to do anything. I just want to see if we can find that buck with the rifle right first. Josh from Braces of Bristol starts a new series on rifle basics. This week, how to bore sight. We're giving away a Jack Pike shooting suit worth £150. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Some hunting outings are simple, some are not, and some play out like a soap opera. This is one of those. When you're stalking like this, it is just painfully slow sometimes but the rewards are immense. It has taken Roy and David hours on their hands and knees to get into this vantage point. No, it's taken days. Three days earlier, we were embarking on an afternoon stalk for a fellow buck during an exciting time of the year, the rut. We're going to go down onto our old rutting stands. Well, not mine personally, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to go down onto the, the fallow rutting stands this evening and see if we can rattle anything up. It's very quiet at the moment. I was hoping it was going to be kicking off, um, but I've not heard anything as yet. This is the sort of thing Roy was hoping for. These lovely shots were filmed by our friend Carlos Carubia in a deer park a week ago. On our day out with Roy, we see nothing and we hear nothing. Cut to today and the weather is tropical. Southerly winds have blown in 18 degree temperatures and rain. The conditions are completely wrong, but Roy likes a challenge. Trying to stalk autumn fallow in the rut in a tropical storm is definitely not conducive to success. I would say on most occasions, that you stand more chance of seeing deer being out than you do in bed. But today, I don't know. Come on. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling it at all. No. no. Are you, David? No. No. <laughs> but there's, there's more chances. We've not stalked all the ground. We've not cocked it all up yet. So you never know. Our approach to what Roy believes is still an active rutting stand is painfully slow. The Pulsar Helion 2 XP50 Thermal is proving helpful with so many potential wily does between us and our prize. The closer we get, the greater the chance of bouncing deer. Roy swears he hears a buck. Then he does spot one, and it has headgear. They've lifted, but they're not quite sure what's going on at the moment. They're just on the top of the bank, they can't do anything, but I've just noticed there's a buck with, looks like a load of rope wrapped around his head and antlers, so I really would like to try and get on to him. I've already the help with no shot, no backstop. This is now our target. The rope is caught around the buck's throat and antlers. We need to find it, but we have to run the gauntlet. 
Over the ridge we discover the rutting stand. It's busy. The master buck is covering its does. It's fascinating to watch, but there is no sign of the tangled up buck. A little bit of love in the woods. Fantastic. For me, growing up, stalking, he's had it again. He's got it, the good old boy. Um, growing up, being able to spend time out in the countryside watching wildlife. Whether you're hunting or whether you're just admiring and watching and learning. It is just the most fascinating thing you can do. Just seeing the rut going off in front of you, doesn't matter how long or how many years you've been doing it, it's just always fascinating watching behaviours. And I think this is part of the fascination of hunting because you build up such a deep respect and admiration and understanding for the animals. And just by being able to stalk into a little rutting stand like this, and just spend an hour watching everything go on. I mean, yeah, we are in pursuit of an animal that we do need to take, but just being able to watch that behaviour going on, I mean, it was really interesting then, after the, uh, the older buck had mounted that doe several times, then one of the young prickets came in, um, and all the other does were smelling the doe that had just been mated, and he came in and he tried to cover exactly the same doe, but she wasn't standing for him. So she would, she stood and stood and stood and stood for the, the mature buck on the stand. But she would not, would not have anything from that little bricket. No. We now have to try and see if he's on the other side of the stand. This will mean a lot of crawling. Shit up our tactics now, because again, we've got all the prickets here, but I really, really want to try and get onto that buck. So we're going to drop back now. We're going to go back to the tree line, try and get up through the bracken to our left hand side and drop in. But it's going to be high risk because going down there and then coming up over the top, we're going to be skylined and everybody's camped up. Everybody's obviously looking this way because obviously the wind direction's coming this way. So all we can hope for is that they're all a little bit tired because they've been running hard that we might get away with it and get round there and see if we can pick up that buck. Wish us luck. If not, then we're coming back. Unfortunately, our perseverance and doe dodging does not pay off and we don't find our buck. The day doesn't end there. On the way back to the truck, we discover a youngster trapped in a fence. Just try. It's down to the bone. Down to the bone. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Poor little thing. Unfortunately, she's always been struggling for a little bit, and the uh, the wire has just cut straight through to her tendons and onto her bone. So there was not a lot we could do for her. So uh, we just had to put her out of her misery, bless her. Uh, no, that really is a pity. Never nice seeing things like that. But uh, well, no, that's it exactly. I mean, unfortunately, it's um, yeah, we are the custodians of the countryside at the end of the day. So you know, the people that are involved in country pursuits and uh, and country sports, it would have been nice to be able to to let her go um, and put her back with her mum. But um, Unfortunately, there's, uh, there wasn't anything we could do for there. The, the kindest thing and the quickest thing to do, but her out of her suffering was to uh, just shoot her quickly. So, um, as I say, we, we did have a quick look just to see if we could help her and get that out, but the, um, as I say, the damage to the leg was, was too far gone. What a strange day, witnessing wonderful wildlife moments and incredibly sad ones. Let's hope Roy can catch up with the buck with the headdress soon. Now from Big Bad Bucks to David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump.
this is Field Sports Channel News. Three antis are terrorising both wild fowlers and wild fowl on Findhorn Bay in Scotland. Police look on as three antis walk the mud and chase off birds. Local wildfowler Martin Gould says he thinks they believe they're helping geese by forcing them off the bay. They also use selective photos and videos in order to call police, including reporting a wildfowler for leaving a gun and attended when he was four foot from it. Police arrived, looked at the footage and said the wildfowlers had done nothing wrong. Shooting organisation Basque has hit back at Chris Packham's attack on gamekeepers and shooting in the Times newspaper. In the article, Packham alleges the BBC TV presenter Megan McCubbin, who's also the daughter of Packham's partner, faced weeks of vile and hateful messages after Bass pointed out her connection to Packham. The Times reports as fact Packham's speculation that a stolen car which thieves set alight outside Packham's house in the New Forest was an attack on him by shooters. Hampshire Police has not confirmed that its officers were investigating the incident on Friday the 9th of October 2021 as an attack on the BBC TV presenter. It's ludicrous to suggest that Basque would uh, encourage online abuse, whether that's Chris Packham, uh, his stepdaughter or anybody else for that matter. But we do call out the issues and one of the issues we've called out is his stepdaughter Megan McCubbin presenting for the BBC while also being an ambassador for an extremist organisation like LAX. Today we also call out Chris Packham for his comments in the Times newspaper where he admits that he is inciting and inflaming people to get more column inches in effect, more stories. We find that is a bizarre admission, uh, certainly divisive, hypocritical considering it's the behaviour he is accusing others of and we would suggest in the current climate a little bit dangerous. Police took six shots to put down a red deer. Devon and Cornwall police shut the A30 near Bodmin in Cornwall for an hour so they could shoot a distressed stag. A vet with armed police were on the scene. Local man Jay Williamson reported the animal injured and jumping over the barrier in the centre of the dual carriageway. He describes the six shots to put down the animal as upsetting. Thanks to Phil Monckton for the story. A senior fox hunter has been found guilty of helping others get round restrictions on hunting with hounds. Recordings of Mark Hankinson, who has now stepped down as director of the Master of Foxhounds Association, speaking in webinars in August 2020, were leaked online. The prosecution argued he was giving advice to other trail hunters on how to avoid the law. The defence said he was advising what to do if saboteurs disrupted legal hunts. At Westminster Court, Deputy Chief Magistrate Tan Ikram ruled he was encouraging and assisting people to evade the ban on fox hunting. Mr Hankinson was fined £1,000 along with a contribution of £2,500 towards legal costs. The Masters of Foxhounds Association says it's considering an appeal. And that news comes ahead of the National Trust vote on trail hunting on October the 22nd. Antis and Sabs are concentrating their campaigning on the vote with a national push on intimidation both in the media and in the field. Chris Packham used his burning vehicle story as a reason for his supporters to vote to ban trail hunting. The Countryside Alliance has produced a guide for National Trust members on how to vote. Link in the description below. A successful drug bust led to red faces at Bedfordshire Police. As well as discovering Class A drugs at an address in Bedford, police announced they'd taken a gun off the streets of Bedfordshire after officers found this firearm in a washing machine during a warrant. Twitter users poked fun at the police with a series of tweets about the risk of highwaymen in Bedford. A hacked online gun advertising website has now lost its bank account. Following the hack of guntrader.uk, which saw the release of more than 100,000 names and addresses of its users, the owner of the site has emailed clients to say he has closed the firm's account at Barclays, but is now having problems finding a bank that will accept his company's business. Jeremy Clarkson has used his column in the Sun newspaper to say that he feels sorry for Adam Henson. The star of Clarkson's Farm said of his fellow farmer and country file presenter, I actually feel sorry for the show's farmer Adam Henson because I've been in the business long enough to know he's talking with one hand tied behind his back and an off-camera gun to his head. Speaking to Charlie at the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre, Adam Henson praised Clarkson's Farm. I think it's really funny. I think it's attracting a slightly different audience to the Countryfile audience, which is great. 
Um, he says it as, it as it is and explains to people how difficult it is to produce food. And you see the challenges of the weather, um, the, the legislation, the paperwork, you know, everything that goes with British farming. According to a new study, trophy hunting bans on privately fenced farms in South Africa could harm conservation. Researchers from the University of Rhodes in South Africa set out to examine the effect that a local or international ban on trophy hunting would have on the future of these private land conservation areas, fenced off sections of farmland maintained to sustain wildlife. Of those interviewed, 36% of the landowners stated they would transition away from wildlife-based land use and convert to farming livestock in the event of a trophy ban. Italian gun owners are literally up in arms. Padua Police Commissioner Isabella Fusiello asked a local gun collector to reduce his collection from more than 200 guns to 100. Marco Piavan, president of shooting in Padua, successfully argued in court that he needs the guns for his job as ballistic consultant for that court. Meanwhile, in Australia, the government of the state of Victoria have tightened gun laws. The Victorian State Parliament has passed new laws that will make it easier to slap 10-year gun bans on shooters and require many shooters to pay for new gun safes. Opposition politicians offered little resistance to the laws and ended up voting with the government. Australia's National Shooting Council lobbied against the changes with videos such as this. And finally, a squirrel has taken nut storage to a new level. Bill Fisher from North Dakota, USA, owns a black walnut tree that produces nuts that a local red squirrel hides in Fisher's truck. The squirrel mainly puts them under the bonnet and in the bumpers of the Chevy Avalanche, but anywhere will do. Fisher had to unscrew panels in order to clean out 42 gallons of walnuts from his truck. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And if you want to see more of David, he presents the new episode of Field Tester, out now, where Tim Pilbeam does his best to blow up rifle barrels by filling them up with water, sand, unscrewing the moderator, chopping lumps off them. All ideas kindly provided by the Field Sports Nation and carried out under almost laboratory conditions with the help of gunsmiths. So kids, don't try this at home. He explodes some rifles and some myths. Find out more in Field Tester, link in the description below. If you're wondering what targets Tim's using on the range, they are the American-made Pro Shot Splattershot targets, and they are available from VX Tactical, and there's a range for every shooting discipline, and you can order them online via VX Tactical or the Viking Arms Limited Instagram shop, link to those in the description below. Now we start a new series on rifle skills. It is Ballistic Tips. So my name's Josh, I am the newest addition to the team at Braces of Bristol. I've been into the shooting sports pretty much all my life up until this point. Passionate about all elements of shooting. We're going to be going through a mini series to try and improve your riflemanship. Uh, we'll go through different techniques for how to zero your sight and bore sight. A few things on how to fit your scope to yourself and the fit of the rifle to yourself as well. Uh, we'll also go in to look at some elements of shooting, different types of rifle craft, shooting uphill, downhill, the calculations you need to do this, and by the end of it, hopefully improve your shooting and uh, improve your shot. So to zero or bore sight a rifle, be it one that you've recently purchased that you may have just swapped out the scope or the ammunition of the rifle, usually using a flat bench would help in this process to make sure that the rifle does not move as you're trying to sight it. We start the process with taking the bolt out of the rifle. You would then sight down through the bore onto the center of your target, making sure that it is all straight and aligned with your target, usually at 100 meters. Once you're happy where the bore is aligned, you then look up to your rifle scope and make any necessary adjustments to get your crosshairs to align on the center of the target also which then should roughly align your point of aim with your point of impact. 
Once you're happy that you've got your bore aligned with the center of the target and your crosshairs are now flat and centrally aligned with the target, you will then proceed to load around, fire at the target, which is your marker shot. The next thing you would do is then adjust the crosshairs over, up, down, left or right, whichever direction it needs to be moved onto that impact on the target. And in essence, what you should have then done is perfectly aligned your point of impact with your point of aim. The next thing the rifleman should do is, without making any adjustments to the scope, to take aim on the centre of the target to confirm at this point the rifle should be very close in relation to your point of aim to your point of impact and any adjustment should be quite finite. So that's how you would zero your rifle without having to shoot multiple rounds should usually be within three and five rounds from your sight of shot to having a, an acceptable group with the rifle. Thank you, Josh. And if you go to the Braces of Bristol website, you will find an Aladdin's cave of rifle kit. Now, you can't own a rifle in the UK without a firearm certificate. The firearms licensing authorities, the police throughout the UK, seem to be in a muddle after COVID, after lockdowns, and after the Plymouth shootings. It looks like a, it's a postcode lottery at the moment. I visit Andrew, who doesn't want his name or his firearms licensing authority mentioned, because right now he's in the middle of talking to them on the phone. They gave him his certificate, they took away his guns, and he doesn't know why. Well, that was another waste of time. What did they say? They basically said that uh, the firearms officer will get hold of you and it could take whenever she's ready to go. Did they give you a time scale, weeks, months? No, nope, nothing, no. Nope. They have given you time scales in the past, haven't they? Oh, they have, oh yes. They've, they've said to me, you know, um, we'll get the firearm officer to give you a call and that's been going on week in. That's been going on for seven weeks now. Go back, my, um, my firearm certificate was up through renewal on the 12th of August. I had a phone call on the 2nd of August, I had a chat with the firearms officer. Um, she said everything's fine and they actually issued the licence uh, four days later. So I had the licence here, put it in the drawer, thought everything was fine. Um, three weeks later I get two armed officers turn up and say that uh, they've come to take my rifles and my shotguns. And I asked why and they said they didn't know and they asked me to contact the firearms office. Now, Andrew's firearms licensing authority appears to be failing him. Some of them are fine. Throughout the UK, we're hearing that some work throughout the COVID lockdowns. Others offered no renewals, offered no new certificates. So it really depends where you live. Uh, and since the tragic Plymouth shootings, the police and crime commissions have been looking into firearms licensing and have produced a survey which ends today Wednesday the 20th of October 2021 and there's a link in the description below if you want to take part in that. Uh, we'll wait and see how the Home Office rules on this. Meanwhile Andrew would like to see some action. I would like somebody in that department to say why they've actually taken my rifles because I have no idea. Obviously when I filled the forms out I went back over because I keep a copy of everything and everything I filled out was to what they asked. And yet they turn up here, two armed policemen with side guns and tasers and all this here and they, nobody gives me a reason. Why? No reason whatsoever. Now, as part of a series of films we recorded in the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre in July, which we are putting out as mini podcasts, I talked to the author of a new book about our uplands in Coghill. Now, it sounds like a dry old subject, but I've read this one. It's called Moreland Matters. And if there's a book you could have given to Napoleon in 1814 or to Kaiser Wilhelm in 1913 that would have said, it's not worth it, mate, then this is the book to give to the RSPB, the National Trust, Natural England and Chris Packham. It spells out so clearly where they are going wrong and where we, the shooters, the gamekeepers, the people who live in the countryside, get it right. Go to Wales. You can find Lake Burnley, which ceased to be a grey school 40 years ago, been managed by the RSPB for 40 years. When they took it over, if you take one species, the curlew, they, they said, in a publication of their own, that there were large numbers of breeding curlew on the moor. Last year they applied for a £3.3 million grant from um, 
and the Heritage Lottery Fund, and the reason that they needed it included the fact that there weren't any curlium. Now that's not my fault, it's not Grace Moorkeeper's fault, it is the fault of the people that manage that ram. There's a link in the description below to take you to the full interview and the book itself is available in our shop at its list price. You do get it cheaper from Amazon, but buying it from us helps support what we do. As does joining the Field Sports Nation, whose benefits I spell out each week and this week include how to enter our competition to win a £150 Jack Pike Digicam suit, comprising jackets, trousers, top, snood and hat. It's lightweight, weatherproof and designed for shooters. Link to the Field Sports Nation in the description below. Now from country clothing to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Productive is how Robin Foxer describes the action in his latest episode, which shows that as soon as the wheat fields are cut, it's time really to get on top of the foxes on your ground. Jaff from the South Somerset Ferreters is back on the Corvids, helping out on a dairy farm in this film called Crow Shooting Rook Shooting. Thanks to Field Sports Nation member Alexander Laver, who recommends this well put together film on shot placement and reaction to shot from a hunter with years of experience and a big film library of hunts. Richard Walton suggests a couple of films from the Wild Fowler channel including this one, a biography of Ernie James, the last of the Fen Tigers who made a living by eel catching and punt gunning. Edge of the Outbacks channel is shooting feral pigs, cats and foxes with his 308 and Pulsar Thermion 2 XP50 scope. Thanks to Field Sports Nation member Alan Basnett for recommending it. Alan calls him an Aussie who says it as it is. The duck season is underway in the USA and Mindak Outdoors puts out this from the Midwest. Kayak duck hunting including mallards, widgeon and and redheads. For a real cowboy growl, listen to Catch Its Tail on the Western Horseman's channel, where Arizona rancher Warner Glenn explains how his hounds are not just tools for his trade, but family members that do him a good service. And finally, thanks to Lynx Loves Chamois on Instagram, who recommends this from 2014, a tongue-in-cheek video poking fun at the rise in voluntourism, perfect for our Prime Minister's neo-colonial wife and her pals. That's it for this week. I put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right, or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film, we would like us to pop into the weekly top eight email me the link charlie at field sports channel.tv well that's it for this week if you haven't done so already please whiz over to our website field sports channel.tv you can click like us there on facebook and on instagram follow us on twitter subscribe to us on youtube best of all pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain it's out 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and this has been field sports britain good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye <laughs>